Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I told Wendy to keep it short, because when people go on and on and on, then I have to live up to it. <laughs> I really like it when they go, well, I don't really know her, but here's Beth, and then... And then there's nothing, you know, those expectations are low. Um, my name is Beth. I'm an alcoholic. Because of God's grace, AA, and sponsorship, I've been sober since June 26, 1988. And uh, my home group's here. We clap. <laughs> One thing I noticed when I moved to North Carolina, it was very quiet here. I, you know, it's just quiet. And, and we came from a, I got sober in Cincinnati, Ohio, and in our home group up there, we clapped if you got your name right. So it was, it was really an adjustment. I was laughing when Matt was saying, I'm in trauma, like it's a good thing. I was thinking my new girls say that all the time. But, uh, we can help you with that. Um, I want to thank him for his talk. I, I drift sometimes. I love having the window here because like when the ADD sets in, I still look like I'm paying attention. <laughs> when he was talking about being the prodigal son and everything going great, I thought right now would be a great time for the sun to just shine through the window behind him. But I have to work on that. Um, I'm honored to participate in the first acts of recovery here. I, uh, I have attended a few up and down the coast, and I just I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love any chance for anybody to get to come do stuff like this. Um, I was introduced to conventions early on, and I have found the best way I can describe it is that there's an enthusiasm there that you don't always get in a meeting. When I get to a convention, I'm surrounded by people who are, who are here on purpose, who are enthusiastic enough about Alcoholics Anonymous that on purpose they take time out of their day to do extra things. And, uh, and it's just like putting air in my tires. I have always... You know, from, from being brand new, I think I went to the first OEPA when I was 39 days sober in 1984, and uh, I was so inspired I stayed sober for three days. I just, <laughs> I mean, it was awesome. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. You know, they had a band, for, and, and I'm watching the dance thinking, something's just not right here, and I couldn't figure it out until the third set started. And when the band started the third set and the dance floor was full, I realized that the dance floor had been full from the very first song of the very first set because nobody had to drink through the first two sets before they were drunk enough to dance. And we just do it different here, you know. Um, this isn't somewhere I wanted to be. I was not excited about being in AA. I avoided AA like the plague. I, I was 29 when I got sober and... Uh, my, I, I was six or seven when my dad got sober. So I had Alcoholics Anonymous in my house growing up. I, you know, I don't really remember his drinking much. I was very young when he got sober. Uh, we lived in Oxford, Ohio. I grew up in a small town. I, I was very resentful about that. I'd been born in California, and I was pretty sure I would have made it if I could have been a California girl. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but I'm in this dinky little town in Ohio, and... Uh, I remember the first day of first grade looking at a map of the United States and there's here's California and the oceans and Florida and Texas, Texas and you know, in Ohio. And <laughs> and I remember thinking that you could look at a map and tell that nothing's happening in Ohio. You know, I mean it's not there's no cool history, there just was nothing and and I know now that I was already restless, irritable, and discontent as a six-year-old. You know, I was an only child, but we always lived next to big families, and I would just go absorb myself into their family because I could not be alone with myself. Even, you know, at six years old, I was in bad company if I was alone, and everybody in my, there's always been just a chorus of voices in my head. I love when Clancy says, the guy who diagnosed him with a split personality was a fraud because if he could have got it down to two voices, he could have made it. And I, was like, I so relate to that. I had a committee, and none of them, you'd think I could get one friendly voice up there, but none of them liked me. And it, they just would tell me things like, nobody likes you, and they just play with you because their mom makes them, and they're all laughing about when you fell down playing kickball last week, and, you know, and that's a stupid dress, and your hair's curly, and, you know, that was a, I, I grew up in the era of Marsha Brady, and I had 
wavy hair. So I just was doomed from the beginning. I'm, you know, if I'd had long, straight hair, you'd have another speaker. And, uh, <laughs> but I just couldn't, you know, I just never was comfortable by myself. I couldn't, I, it was just unfriendly. I had to be where there was noise. I had to be, I was just very busy. I was just busy. You know, I was swimming in Girl Scouts and on up into junior high and pep club and band and student council and yearbook staff and you name it, I was doing it. If there was a committee, I was on it. I, uh, my, my first, I made a mistake of telling Chuck, my husband, what my first grade report card said and he's never let me live it down. It said that Beth has excellent leadership potential, but she, te she tends to be a bit bossy at times. <laughs> They say that like it's a bad thing. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, so I was just doing, 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 doing. Because if I stopped, all the noise in my head caught up. And I just never was comfortable just being. I never was where I was. If you know, I mean, if you know what that means, you're in the right place. I, I was a spectator in my own life. There was always like this camera up in my head watching everybody else watch me and evaluating and you know I never really had a conversation with somebody till I was six months sober I would you would start to talk I would finish your sentence in my head choose from my six or seven available answers you know I mean my sponsor says that alcoholics don't really have conversations it's just two people talking a lot and, and uh, that's true I just I remember I mean I remember the first time I had a conversation with somebody where I realized like they're talking and I'm listening till they're done, and then I'm ant I was six months sober, almost 30 years old, when I finally had a conversation. But I just never, you know, I was always watching everybody watch me. I couldn't function without, you know, who do I have to be to fit in? Who do I have to be to be okay? Who do I have to be? Because the whole time I was saying, I don't care what you think. I desperately cared what you thought, you know. Uh, but I didn't think I cared what you thought, and, and I really just cared so that, because if you thought that I was okay, then I was okay. <laughs> and if you understand that, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> um, I, you know, rooms separated into two groups of people. If I walk into a big room full like this, it's all of you and me. Um, I don't know what to say after my name's Beth. I never have. I'm, a, I'm the, one of the best, and that's probably why I'm so effective, you know, walking the AA greet newcomer things, because when you're a greeter, you don't really actually have to talk to people. You just greet them on the way by, and then other people have to talk to them. So if you're new and you don't know what to do, just greet. It's awesome. You can look willing, but you don't really have to interact. Because uh, I don't know what to say after my name's Beth. I just don't know, and I never knew. And I, if I would meet somebody and say, you know, okay, fine, hi, my name's Beth, and he'll say, my name's Peter, and... <sighs> Now he's just looking at me, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's my turn to talk. Everybody in my head is now telling me it's my turn to talk. He's just staring at you. What are you going to do? Say something. What are you going to say? Kentucky won? I hate Kentucky. You know, just on and on. <laughs> Sorry, outside issue, I know. Uh, it's been humbling watching my brackets go down in flames this weekend. But, I, you know, so anyway, everybody in my head's arguing. I'm just staring. He's staring at me. It's my turn to talk. I don't know what to say. They're arguing. I'm paralyzed. We have to go, you know. And I just, I just can't, and I'm, you know, and I can't go back there again because there she is. You know, I just, I just couldn't function unless I was busy. And, uh, and I was restless, irritable, discontent by age six. I thought that if I lived somewhere else, it would be better. If I had straight hair, it would be better. If my mother sat different, it would be better. If she didn't smoke, if she didn't work, if she, you know, I laid a lot of my issues at her feet because um, she was handy. But I just always wanted to be somewhere else with somebody else doing something else. I never, ever was happy right where I was. Um, that's one of the bigger gifts that I've gotten here is that I'm, I can be where my hands are most of the time. And most of the time I want to be where I am. But, you know, up until I took a drink, I was busy. And, uh, and you know, I, one of the things I found since I got sober, and I know a lot of you, I do live local, so I know a lot of you guys have heard this story, but it just really illustrates my thinking to me. Um, when I got sober, my kids were four and six years old. And uh, my daughter was four, Robbie was six, a lot of you guys know Robbie. And uh, 
So Sarah, we're looking at, you know, by the time she's six or seven, thinking, oh, my God, they better keep AA intact. Because, well, Chuck and I used to tell people, you know, you might be saving for college. We're saving for treatment. And uh, <laughs> she could lie. And uh, so we're just waiting, you know, we're just waiting. And when she was 11, she decided she wanted to be on a swim team. A lot of her friends swam. And so we took her to try out, you know, and the coach said, well, you can, you can be on the team, but... You know, she hadn't had much experience in the water, so he said, I want you to practice down an age group. So this meant, at 11 years old, he wants her to swim with the 9-year-olds, you know, and that was okay with her. That would not have been okay with me. I couldn't have done it. And I was 7 years sober when it happened, and I was having kind of a hard time being the mom (laughs) of the 11-year-old who's swimming with the 9-year-olds, because how am I going to look, for God's sake, if my kid is a loser? She's fine. She goes to practice. She's only in the water a couple weeks at the first swim meet. These are USS teams, big meets. They post anybody walking by could just look and see how you did with their name. And, you know, and and she was 70th out of 72 in her first race, and she went back the next day. You know, I would have been trying to get my parents to relocate. (laughs) I would have had to leave town. And... uh, and we said, okay, Sarah, now you've got a baseline time. You know, even though you didn't win, um, you've got a baseline time in, in your next race, even if you don't win again. If you beat your time, it's a successful race, right? Now, I know that's in the parent handbook of crap you're supposed to tell your kids. You know, I wasn't buying it. I thought it was, you know, my parents told me the same thing when I swam. I knew they had to tell me that stuff. And uh, she beat her time. She was happy. You know? Now, the rest of that story is that two years later, she was a state double-A swimmer. You know? we, were, she, we always say we, like I'm in the water with her. She was swimming all over the Midwest. You know? And I would have missed every bit of that the day they told me to practice with the nine-year-olds. I could not have done it. And at 11 years old, she had never had a drink, and neither had I. You know? But we reacted to life so completely differently. And what I know now is she doesn't really even react to life. I react. You know, when the big book says our reaction to life has changed, that implies that we react. (laughs) It took me a while to catch on to that. Um, You know, she just lives life. She just does what's in front of her. I go this way until I crash into something, and then at whatever angle I come off at, that's where I go. And I'm pretty sure I'm an accountant now because it was just the path of least resistance. You know, I just... Because if it looks like work, you know, my daughter somehow internalized that message of set a goal, work for the goal, achieve the goal. You know, that just seemed like a lot of work to me. I, just give me the goal, you know. I, I mean, if I could have got Peter to just give me the present, I wouldn't even be up here talking. <laughs> She, she does that stuff, and I couldn't. And so I started to see, you know, that one of the things that, that, about sticking around is kind of the longer I'm here, the more alcoholic I know I am. And I started to realize how different my thinking was long before I ever picked up a drink, you know, that I was completely... I came around AA a few times, and I heard that we were self-centered, and I didn't really get that because I thought self-centered meant vain and selfish. Just ask me. I'm neither of those. And uh, I am the most loving, giving person I know. And uh, as long, of course, as there's something in it for me. Um, But I I just, you know, self-centered, what is that? I didn't know self-centered meant that I thought everybody was watching me all the time and that I thought everybody was talking about me all the time and that if I can't win, I don't want to play. And if I might fail at it, I am not. I never tried anything new in public ever because you might see me do it wrong or fail. So I would go home and try things in private. You know, I just never, I couldn't risk failure in public because I knew that you would all be talking about it until the day I died. You know, I just, and and I just, I didn't, I didn't know that was self-centered. You know, the big book says that, that when we do an inventory, we find that the world and its people dominated us. And I didn't get that because, I mean, I, I ran with a crowd of very large people in black leather that rode motorcycles and you know while I never fought um, strictly out of a fear of being humiliated in public it was no high moral stand I just didn't want you to hit me back if I hit you and uh, 
I knew it hurt, I would cry, and I would look bad. And, uh, but, you know, so I, I didn't really get, I looked like I would fight, so nobody messed with me much. And uh, I didn't understand when the book said that the world and its people dominated us, because I read that as physically dominated, and nobody, you know, nobody messed with me. But what I've come to understand is what dominated me was what you thought of me. What dominated me was who do I have to be to fit in? Who do I have to be to get him? Who do I have to be to get rid of him? Who do I have to be to get this job? Or, you know, on and on and on. What dominated me was I spent my entire life trying to arrange your perception of me so that I could be comfortable. Because what I think about me has nothing to do with what I think about me. What I think about me has everything to do, not even with what you think about me, but with what I think you think about me. <laughs> and again, if you understood that, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> So as you can tell, by the time I took a drink, it was a relief to me and probably to everyone around me. Um, <laughs> I didn't get real drunk the first time because my friends were experimenting and falling down and throwing up and looking bad, and I don't like to look bad. So I just put on a glow, and it was enough. I went and got my friend the next day and got her drunk with me so I'd have somebody to drink with. And the friendship didn't make it another, another year because we drank different from the start. I can totally relate to the binge drinking thing. It makes no sense unless you drink every day. You know, I totally get that. Because I, the only thing that kept me from being a daily drinker from the start was access. If I could have gotten it every day, I would have been drinking every Because, I mean, my God, why wouldn't you? You know, I just, I, sometimes I forget to mention that I absolutely loved to drink. Morning drinking, I, why not? I mean, well, it just makes sense when you're in high school because you have to sober up before your parents get home from work. You know, it makes a lot more sense to start at 8 in the morning than, than to start at 3 and not be able to really enjoy yourself. But, you know, I loved to drink. I loved morning. I just loved, I loved everything about it. I just relaxed when I drank. And I wasn't a fighting drunk. I wasn't a falling down drunk. I wasn't a throwing up drunk. I wasn't a crying drunk. I was... I would have told you I was a social drinker, you know, really. I mean, the more I drank, the more social I got. And I was very social by last call, and uh, that was dating. <laughs> I got to AA. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of all over the place today. It's, it's busy season. I'm a little loopy. Um, I, uh, I got to AA and my sponsor told me that dating and sex were not the same thing. Now, who knew? I, I mean, who knew that, really? I, it's what you started with, right? And then if you liked them, they, I mean, you know, you meet them on Friday. If they're still at your house on Sunday, it's a relationship. And uh, so, so my sponsor told me dating and sex aren't the same. Chuck and I actually met in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and his sponsor has given him direction, like, all right, ask her out ahead of time, you know, go to the door, knock on the door, walk her to the car, open the car door, be sure she's in the car before you close the car door. <laughs> we did AA dating, which, you know, is like coffee before the meeting, coffee after the meeting. You're never really sure if you should be kissing goodnight or saying the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk a little more about that later, but in case I forget, we are going to be married 19 years this July. So, <laughs> but first, I had to ruin my life and get sober. So, um, <laughs> from the minute I started drinking, everything changed. Uh, there's a list floating around Al-Anon if you suspect your kids are drinking. You know. It, as their friends changed, grades plunged, on and on. I was all of the above. Um, for whatever reason, I just kind of slid through doing it. I graduated high school probably because I didn't drink my freshman year and I had a bunch of credits stacked up. I, I went off to college because that's what you did, uh, where I, I grew up in a college town. And, uh, you know, I went to college. I had 98th percentile test scores going in, and I had a, a 1.8 GPA at the end of the first semester. <laughs> Because I couldn't drink. See, I bet you thought I was drinking all the time. But I, now, as bad as I wanted out of Ohio, the big, because I, I really, when I found out it was warm other places year-round, I was ready to move. I campaigned annually to get my parents to move south, and they wouldn't do it. 
So about two years ago, I kind of woke up one day and went, why in God's name did I go to college in Indiana? <laughs> you know? As bad, I mean, I went like two hours due west of where I grew up to get out of Ohio. And uh, it was a 21 state. I mean, they, they didn't even have 3-2 beer. And uh, it, I, so I had no access to alcohol much. I, I smoked a lot of pot that year, but it's just not the same. And, uh, you know, I am an alcoholic. I, I was a child of the 70s. There was much to do um, in the 70s. And, uh, and I did most of it. My favorite was yours. And... Um, <laughs> But I'm an alcoholic, and eventually all those drugs started to interfere with my drinking. And, and anything that interferes with my drinking has to go. And so, you know, by the time I, I was looking at getting sober, I pretty much was back to just drinking because I just, you know, I mean, the, this whole class of drugs over here just meant I blacked out at 6 o'clock instead of midnight. And, and, you know, these over here was kind of my I'm not drinking drug. There was a lot of that floating around in Florida, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's easy to not drink with free cocaine. It just is. And uh, nothing tastes good anyway, you know. And, and I just, and then there was the diet pills, which I still find. Those I miss periodically because it just, it's the only time in my life that I could drink for days. I was skinny and my house was clean, you know. <laughs> By the time I was 25, I couldn't, I, I would hate me after a day. I just, I knew things were getting bad. Uh, I had, I had uh, kind of tended to get things in bulk because I had moved from Florida back to Ohio. I spent six years in Florida and uh, got married down there, had a couple kids down there, got divorced down there. Well, actually, I just, it, I mean, the whole marriage thing, but I had this principle of like never, ever, ever admit when you're wrong. And, uh, and that's what caused a five-year marriage. There really, I would say there shouldn't have been a second date, but there was no date. We met at last call. And uh, five years later, it's still dragging on because neither of us is going to cry uncle. And um, <laughs> he finally said, get out, which I'd been waiting for because, you know, if I leave, then it's my fault, right? <laughs> so I'm not leaving. But when he said get out, he only had to say it once. And, uh, and my mom, you know, she would relocate me back to Ohio, but, but not in Florida. So in 1984, I found myself back in Ohio. And I'd had some adventures in Florida. I mean, I was on the West Coast in South Florida for four years, and then I lived in the Keys for two years. Wonderful place for an alcoholic there. I worked at an oceanfront resort in the Keys, and it just, you know, all the old quiet money went down the road. We were up there with Tiki John Rum Runners and fast boats and just... Hundred dollar bills, and you guys know where I was, and uh, and I just, oh my God, it just, it just, it's so surreal. I think they couldn't really have run a business. All the security guards were bikers. I mean, it just, it just was. A, I got paid. I, I had the keys to seven bars on the property. It just, God, that was the best job I ever had. And. <laughs> But we had started a little home-based business, too, because it's kind of expensive living in the Keys. And, you know, there was a lot of importing and exporting going on down there. And so we had a little local distributorship. And, uh, and they, uh, turns out, they, I thought of it as a part-time job, but they called it sale of a controlled substance. So things started going bad down there. And, and you know, he finally said, get out. And, and uh, so I find myself in Ohio in 1984. Now, I had been to one AA meeting, two AA meetings in 1983 in Florida. I periodically, when I was home visiting, would see my dad, and he would take me to a meeting with him just to meet his friends, I figured, you know. And uh, I would say, my name's Beth. I'm with him when they would go around and introduce themselves. But I got fired from this job. Uh, this great resort job because I was I had gone to happy hour at five and I was still there at eleven when I was supposed to clock in. They weren't very happy with me, and um, so I, I went to an AA meeting. It was a Tuesday night Key Largo group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, they were very nice. They were, you know, it was like one of the circle of chairs in the middle of the room, you know, with no table to hide behind or anything, and. Everybody's all relating to each other, and thanks, Bob, I can really relate to that, and I just thought, oh, just shoot me now, and, you know, I, the meeting's over, they invited me to Perkins, and I just thought, I'm, I'm doing this little inventory in my head, thinking, okay, let me see, I'm, I'm 24 years old, it's 9.30 at night, I have a Harley parked down the street, and 
I've just been invited to Perkins. <laughs> My life is over. <laughs> and uh, I passed on the Perkins, as fun as it sounded. And uh, I went and told my boss that I knew I had a problem and I was going to AA and I got my job back. One AA meeting, it works, it really does. Because <laughs> that was the story of my life. I mean, I just would get, I never got the consequences I should have. It made my mom just berserk. She has this twisted idea that you should have consequences for your actions. And I was like that cartoon guy that walks down the sidewalk and the safes and the pianos are just crashing behind him, you know, I would get clipped every now and then, but I never got, I mean, the only time I ever got suspended from school for drinking, it snowed that night and there was no school the next day, so my record's clean, and I mean, that stuff just happened to me all the time, I had a, what should have been a DUI when I was 16 years old, and I smashed a car into a bridge with three other people in it, and I just got a bill from Butler County for the bridge repair, I mean, it just on and on and on like that, and, and even the, the uh, legal problems in Florida, you know, I kind of walked out of that with probation, and, but, you know, getting fired from this job, I, I went to the meeting, I went, I got, you know, crashed, there goes another piano, I get my job back, I went to the Friday night Key Largo group of Alcoholics Anonymous and told them I got my job back, thank you very much, and that was the end of my AA career in the Keys. Um, I did call my dad and tell him I'd been to a meeting, and within a week I got a box from him, and it had a big book, 12 and 12, <laughs> each day a new beginning, 24 hours a day, one day at a time, a tape of his talk. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how long he'd been throwing it all in the box, but by God, it was in the mail after the first meeting. And uh, so I go back to Ohio, and that's when I thought, all right, fine, I'll try AA. I really thought if I just quit drinking with bikers, things would calm down. But... You know, and, and I gotta tell you, in 1984, Alcoholics Anonymous and Cincinnati Young Peoples was on fire. Icky Paw had been in Cincinnati in 1983. And they were lit up up there. That Monday night Young Peoples meeting was 200 people. You know, Friday Night Live was 150 people. And it was enthusiastic, structured, sponsored, out of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. But when I walk into a big room, it's all of you and me and you all know each other, and you're all talking about that stupid book, you know, and I don't know what to do. I, I know what to do if I go to a bar and don't know anybody, you know, 50 cents for the pool table and a couple dollars for beer. Actually, when I drank, it was $8 for a beer. And uh, I just, you know, I, I know who I need to know at the end of the night. If I got five bucks, I'm walking to a bar by myself. I'd rather walk into the bar by myself because you never really know when true love's going to strike and you've got to be available, you know. And, <laughs> And uh, within a year of being back in Ohio, my children were removed from my custody because they were asleep in bed, and I walked down to the corner bar to drink because I had to drink. There was nothing to drink in the house. And thank God nothing happened to him, but my son woke up, and he couldn't find me, and he came down to the front porch, and, uh, and, and he, he couldn't reach the door to get back in the house because he stepped down to come out the door, and he cried, and the neighbors called the police. Police called me at the bar and said, do you want to come home? And I was thinking, no, not really. <laughs> but I, I came home, and, and I went to jail, and, and my kids, you know, my mom got that 2 a.m. call that nobody wants to get. Come get your grandchildren. Your daughter's under arrest. And it was suggested to me that if I went through treatment, I might not go to jail for six months. That seemed like a darn good plan at the time. And uh, I ended up in this all-woman treatment center. That was just God's cosmic joke on me because, I, you know, by now I, I periodically would, would pass through AA. And I, and I just, you know, I come in AA and the first thing they say is hang out with the women. And I just thought, you've got to be kidding me. I, d I mean, I didn't even drink with women. I could keep up with the men. Why would I drink with women, you know? And, and I just, because women to me were, well, in high school, they're just an annoyance. I mean, you know, the, with the girls drink in high school, there's giggling and falling down and throwing up. And everybody likes the same boy. And later, it's just more complicated because there's issues like, oh, that was your husband. I'm sorry. And, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was just easier to drink with men. And, uh, and I, so I come to AA, and, and they say hang out with the women, and that was just one more reason that I did not want to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. But I went to this treatment center that was all women, and it was six weeks long. Um, but, you know, I had my little box from my dad when I went, so I, I, get to, I already got my own big book. I've underlined a few things if you want to see what I think is important. 
and I got a tape of my dad's talk that you don't, you know, and, uh, and I'm a test taker too, you know, I'm, I'm a, if you're a test taker, you know that you are, and I, so if you're a test taker, you can ace treatment every time. I can be a rock star at treatment. Now, you know, the drawback to being a test taker is two days after the test, you don't remember any of the material. And so it didn't really work for me in AA, but uh, boy, I could, I could ace treatment. And so I'm the one, they, they get to come talk to women at the treatment center who don't want to leave their kids for six weeks because, you know, I can tell them all the right things. I got all the right lines. If we're not sober, we can't be parents at all. And better six weeks now than forever later. But I got a problem, you know, and part of the problem is, as I was staying in that treatment center, I was starting to realize that I didn't really want my kids back. You know, the big book talks about a double life, the one we know is true and the one we want people to see. And it was becoming clear to me that my kids were way better off at my mom's. I mean, she read them a story every night. They got a bath every night. They slept on clean sheets. They went to daycare in clean clothes, having had breakfast. I couldn't do any of that. And I hated her for doing it. I mean, don't think that I was thankful to her at all. I made her life miserable for it. But I just, you know, I, I was sitting thinking, and I didn't really want to be done drinking. I was 25, you know, and, and uh, 26, somewhere in there. And I, but I, you can't tell people you don't want your kids. I mean, talk about looking bad, you know. You just, you, it's not the kind of thing you bring up and go, how are you doing, Beth? Well, you know. And so I had this double life going, and I'm telling women we've got to be sober. And if you'd ask me, I said, of course I want to be sober, you know, because I really want to get my kids back. But nothing in my actions said that, you know. One of the things I've learned here is that it doesn't really matter what's coming out of my mouth. It matters what my feet are doing. You know, there's a saying that I love that says, what you do speak so loudly, we can't hear what you say. And, uh, and uh, one of the great AA speakers who died in the last few years, Vince Yo, used to say that your priorities aren't really what you say they are. Your priorities are what you do. You know, you can say this is your priority. And I went through that a lot in sobriety that, you know, early passing in and out. I would tell you being sober was my priority, but I wasn't going to meetings. I wasn't calling a sponsor. I'd get a sponsor, so if you asked me, I could say, okay, I got one. It's her, but I wouldn't actually call her, you know. And then I wouldn't call, and then I wouldn't call, and then I'd have a problem. And then I'd think, well, she'll only think I call her when I have a problem, you know, so now I can't. But I just, you know, nothing in my actions said it was a priority, but my mouth was, but... But uh, so that's that's a good spot check for me today. Is you know what are my feet doing? What are what? Because it just I can talk a good game. I'm a test taker. And uh, so anyway, I went through treatment. I didn't stay sober. I went through treatment again. I didn't stay sober. Um, between the, and, and one of the things that happened while I was in treatment the first time is that my dad died and I was the only child of divorced parents. So I got the insurance money and uh, that allowed me to drink the way I wanted to drink for the next two and a half years. And by the end of 1987, the checkbook was tired. I was tired. I was living in a friend's attic. Um, I just couldn't, you know, I just couldn't function. And uh, somewhere in late 1987, I just kind of hit an emotional bottom and said, God, I just cannot live like this. You've got to do something. And I remembered that big book that my dad had sent me. You know, now I'd always had it in treatment, and I always started page one Bill's story because, you know, you get a treatment, and they tell you the design for living's in here, the directions are in here. And you open up to page one, Bill's story, because, you know, those Roman numerals, if they wanted you to read them, they would have made them page one, right? That's just for the overachievers in treatment, I thought. And, you know, so I open up my big book to get my directions for living, and it's say, war fever ran high in a New England town. And I just think, oh, this is so helpful, you know? <laughs> so, all right, I'm ready, you know. And it, I mean, my whole thing on Bill's story was, he's old, he's dead, who cares? And... Uh, <laughs> But that night I read Bill's story and I identified for the first time. You know, I just, I felt how he felt. And I thought how he thought. And I slept with my big book um, like a teddy bear. And the next morning I woke up and just felt relieved, you know, like it had lifted. Um, not the first time that had happened. I can look back and see three or four times in my life where God had absolutely removed the obsession to drink. But the other thing I've learned here is there's a difference between surrendering and staying surrendered. And all those times when the obsession is lifted, it's not going to stay gone if I'm not taking some kind of action to stay surrendered. And I didn't do a thing the next day to stay surrendered. I didn't read anything else. I didn't call anybody. I didn't go to a meeting. You know, and eventually everybody in my head met without me and decided we should drink. And, and uh, But it was early 88 was just kind of a weird, you know, 
I was drinking in the Dew Drop Inn in Norwood, Ohio, just a lovely place. And, uh, you know, everybody in the Dew Drop is talking about getting sober and going to AA. It was really weird. And, uh, and I finally, in, in uh, June of 88, looked around and said, you know, I've been up here four years. I bet everybody in Florida is going, God, I wish Beth would come back. And so I ran away from home at age 29 and went down to Florida for a week and, you know, I'm tired. Mom's credit card was tired. I didn't have money, but I had an emergency credit card of hers, and going to Florida was an emergency. And uh, one way, because I'm never coming back, and, you know, so at the end of a week, on June 26, 1988, I'm in the Fort Myers, Florida airport, and the credit card will not take a plane ticket back, and I don't even have a dollar. You know, I don't have enough for one beer, because if I got enough for one, I can get two. But I didn't want to be asked to leave the airport bar because it would have been obvious I was just hanging out looking for a drink. And I thought about trying to steal some little old lady's purse and maybe get some cash, but I'm a coward at heart, and I was so hungover, I knew I'd pick on the little old lady that still did aerobics twice a week, and <laughs> she'd run me down, take her purse back, and I'd look so bad. And uh, so I called Mommy, what are you going to do, you know, and told her where I was and what I had done, and she said, call me later, and hung up. That wasn't looking good. And... Uh, and when I called her later, she said, I booked you a plane ticket, but you need to understand I'm not flying you home. I'm flying the children's mother home. And it's just because we're afraid we'll never see you again if we don't. And, uh, and that was June 26, 1988. I hadn't had a drink all day. I got on the plane. I had no idea that was going to be my sobriety date. I'm sure I would have tried to get a drink on the plane, but I just was tired. And she picked me up, and I got in her car, and she drove me straight to the local detox. I was not amused. You know, I was ready to just go home to her house and get a plan together in the morning. And, uh, and she said what I know now is one of the hardest things she's ever said. I'm an only child. And, and, and the detox in Cincinnati, um, just, it was over the Rhine, which is a horrible, horrible part of town. Does anybody watch Harry's Law? Anybody? That's an over the Rhine. Um, I mean, that, it's, that, it's just like that. And, and she took me there, and she said, go in or don't, but you can't go home with me. I've done everything I can do for you, and you have to do it yourself. And she left, and I didn't really give it a thought to it till a couple years ago, that when she drove out of there, she had no idea if she'd ever see me again. Because I could have turned around and walked away into the darkness down there and probably never been seen again. And uh, I went in and went to bed, and the next morning I woke up, and I was kind of mulling over my options, you know, so you know how we are. <laughs> Gotta have a plan, yeah. And, I, you know, I just, I mean, my car was impounded. I didn't have my attic. I was no longer welcome in my attic. Um, I, I had charges pending. I wasn't sure what they were, but I thought they probably had something to do with my car being impounded. You know, further reflection is like that's why going to Florida was suddenly a big emergency. And, uh, you know, none of that stuff was new, but what was new that time was that I didn't have a plan about what to do about any of it. There was no, I had burned every bridge. There just was no friendly direction left. And I just had this passing thought, you know, that because that, I just always thought I would go down in flames. I mean, I was a biker, for God's sakes. You know, we go out big. And, uh, and I just, you know, I just have this passing, wimpy little thought of, well, you know, whatever those AA people are doing seems to be working for them. And clearly what you're doing is not working for you. <laughs> Maybe you ought to try it their way. You know, and that was it. That's the surrender that brought me in the door. If they had told me I'd be dead in six months, because the other thing that happened was I was 29 and a half years old in that detox, and, and I realized I just, I never thought I'd live to be 30. I had absolutely no plans for being 30 years old because I knew I'd be dead. You know, I mean, I mixed drugs and alcohol. I drove drunk. I rode motorcycles drunk. I hung out with people that carried weapons. I bartended places where people shot at each other. I mean, I just should have been dead over and over and over and over and over. And I'm laying in that detox bed at 29 and a half years old realizing I am going to turn 30 and I'm probably going to turn 40 and I'm probably going to turn 50 and people like you don't die, Beth. You're going to live, you know. And no matter whether you keep drinking or not, you're going to be 70 and it's bad now, but there's levels of bad that you haven't even begun to think up yet. And, uh, you know, Bill Crawford from Greensboro calls that grace. He said, there's a minute when we know things, we see them exactly the way they are. And that's what happened for me, is I knew right then I was going to live. If they had told me, if you walk out of here, Beth, and get a beer, you'll be dead in six months, rest assured I would have gotten the beer. But I never attempted suicide because I knew I would live. 
probably be maimed and look bad, you know? <laughs> I just don't do things like that gracefully. And uh, so I just, you know, I, and I had to pass and thought, whatever they're doing in AA seems to work for them. And I turned myself, I just, I got out, I, I got out of detox on Friday of 4th of July weekend. I couldn't get my car till Tuesday. I'd made plans to go into a hotel for women in downtown Cincinnati. That should have been a big sign of surrender there. I couldn't get in there till Tuesday. I couldn't do any. My life was on hold until Tuesday. And I knew if I went to Norwood where I lived, I would drink. And I scraped up a little bit of money, enough to get a very, very cheap hotel room that was right on the bus line so that I could just walk out the door, get on the bus, and ride it down Reading Road to go to 405 Oak Street in Cincinnati. And that's what I did. And I almost didn't go to a meeting the first night because i have been going all week, you know, and, and, and detox. And... Uh, but this voice in my head said, you know, if you don't go now, you'll never go. You skipped meetings before and you drank. And so I got on the bus and I rode it down uh, rode it down there and I walked up on the front porch. And one of the first people I saw was somebody who used to bartend where I drank. And she dropped off the face of the earth two years before. And we both looked at each other and went, oh, I thought you were dead. You know, she'd been sober and who knows where I was. And, uh, and I walked in and the, the, they call them lead meetings up there, a speaker meeting. They call it giving a lead. And the woman given the lead I had met before four years ago when I was passing through, and there she was sitting there four years sober, you know. And she told a room full of people that alcoholism, not drinking, but alcoholism, had taken her to the place where she didn't want to work. She didn't want to take care of her daughter. She just wanted to drink. And I had never heard anyone say out loud that they didn't want to care for their child before because that was my biggest secret. That's the one I couldn't tell anybody. And she was telling a room full of people and I got her number after the meeting, and I stayed for the midnight meeting. Thank God there was a midnight meeting because I was a bar drinker, you know. And I just, I remember, you know, and, and so the, the midnight meeting's over at 1, and I found somebody to, that seemed like they knew everybody to find me a ride back to this hotel so I wouldn't have to ride the bus alone late at night. And I got back to the hotel at about 1.30, and it was right next to this bar called Morita's that we used to frequent periodically when we were out riding motorcycles. And I walked out onto the sidewalk and just stared at the sign, having that battle with myself of, well, I could just go get a Coke and probably shoot a game of pool till the bar closes, you know. And, and the, other, you know, the other voice saying, you did that before and you drank, you know. And I finally just turned around. I had bought a big book while I was at Oak Street, even though I had one, you know, but I kind of knew I couldn't get to mine until Tuesday, and I was going to need it all weekend. So I bought a big book, and I just went back in that hotel, and such that it was, hotel. You know, that's where everybody else checked in all weekend to drink. And uh, so I'm here, doors and bottles and crushing. But I just, like, read my big book, and the next day, thank God it didn't rain, and I just went out to the pool with my big book on one end, and the cases of beer and the dope smoking was on the other end, and then I just rode the bus to Oak Street again. And I started going to meetings every day. I went to a big book meeting every day. Um, there was a noon big book meeting. I was going to maybe go in this halfway house, so I had promised her I would go to a meeting every day for 30 days while I was waiting to get in. And they had this noon big book meeting, which I thought would be great because, you know, they read a whole chapter every day. And uh, so I don't have to read at home, right? This is good. And my day is free at 1. And reading a whole chapter chewed up half of the hour, so maybe I wouldn't have to share and, uh, you know, God's got a great sense of humor because what happened was my day was free at 1, but by 4 I'd remember I had no life, so I'd be back at 6 for the 8.30 meeting a lot. <laughs> and uh, thank God that clubhouse was open all day long because um, yeah, I would just go at 6. I knew if I went home alone I was in bad company, so I would just, I would just go sit down at Oak Street, get a cup of coffee, and sit on the porch. And, uh, and, you know, they, they, they chewed up half of the hour reading, but by hearing it every day, you know, because what I was blessed with, I, I had never been to a meeting where they read two sentences and stopped and talked about it for an hour until I moved here. Um, and I guess we all like what we're used to, but, but for me what happened was because I was hearing that material over and over and over and over, I heard what was in it instead of what everybody thought about it. And... Uh, and it started to sink in, you know, it started to just, I was, I was about two weeks sober, and I was answering phones for my mom at her office because I was unemployable if I didn't, and, uh, and I stopped at Walgreens to run an errand on the way back to her office, and I popped up to see what everybody was chatting about, you know, because they, they all still meet, I just don't check in with them much, 
But I popped up to see what everybody was talking about, and somebody in my head is going, that was so cool what Guy said at the meeting, you know? And somebody else is going, I know, I didn't even know that was in the book, did you? And somebody else is going, I didn't know that was in the book. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, the voices in my head are getting sober, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> they're up there discussing the meeting without me, so I just backed out quietly and left them alone. <laughs> And, uh, and the biggest joke on me was that people who read the big book on purpose, you know, people who go to big book meetings on purpose tend to be the people who read the book and do what it says. And my lazy motives had plopped me into the middle of the most active people in Cincinnati Alcoholics Anonymous. They were on the intergroup council. They were in service. They were on conference committees. I've been on conference committees since I was new. I, they had me answer on phones at intergroup by the time I was 10 days sober. You know, I just got thrown into the middle, and I have stayed there ever since, you know. Um, I have just been busy in Alcoholics Anonymous. When I was about three weeks sober, one of the women in the Big Book meeting said, Beth, you've been around before. Why don't you write an inventory? And I thought, why don't I? I didn't know I could plead that I wasn't ready. And, I, you know, I followed the directions in the Big Book and wrote, you know, I, I, God knows why I knew to turn the page and write the fourth column, too, but I did. And... Uh, and that woman who didn't want to care for her daughter had become my first sponsor, and I shared my fifth step with her. And, uh, I, I mean, I was, they had me making amends by the time I was a month sober. And thank God, because for me, you know, I had so much baggage. I could not have not drank for two months or six months or ten months or a year waiting to do that inventory. You know, uh, that step a month, step a year stuff, I... I I don't know. My printing of the book says, if you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, you're ready to take certain steps. It doesn't say a word about how long you have to be sober to do that. And, uh, and my life just took off. It just took off. I have spent the last 22 years building a relationship with my mother, uh, slowly, very slowly. Um, but in December, she moved to Raleigh, and we were happy. Like, she, she has our address and everything. <laughs> You know, um, I, 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 Chuck and I met in AA. A lot of you guys know Chuck. And, uh, you know, we just, we made a commitment when we started to go out. Both of us are people watchers. I think that came in handy. You know, the first two years I was sober, every time I started thinking I needed a man, one of my friends would get in a relationship and I could just watch and learn and not have to do it myself. And, uh, and Chuck and I made a commitment that when we got together that we never wanted to be higher than third in each other's lives. That, that God had to be first, and then AA, and then each other. And that if I was first in his life, then we were out of kilter. And uh, that has served as well. It's made for some interesting dates. You know, our first New Year's Eve dance date, we were having dinner together, and he got a call, and some new guy needed a ride. And about five minutes later, I got a call, and some new girl needed a ride. So we finished dinner, and he went to Mount Washington, and I went to Carthage, and then we met at the dance, you know, on the New Year's Eve, and then I went back to Carthage and took her home. And, you know, you date in two cars a lot when you're in the middle of AA, but, but it's okay. It's, you know, it's worked out for us, and, um, and we're having a blast. You know, he's got a sponsor. Uh, our home group's the Fox Hall speaker meeting Wednesday nights at uh, 7 <laughs> And, uh, and we have a good time. You know, we insist on enjoying life. We just do. Um, my sponsor is forging a path ahead of me. She turned 47 years sober this year, and she still goes to four or five meetings a week. She's active in service. She sponsors other women, and I want what she has, so I do what she does. You know, that was the one message I got early on was, if you want what we have, you have to do what we do. You, you can't do what the one meeting a week let's meet for lunch people do and get what we have. And uh, so I have stayed in the book. I have stayed in the middle. I'll give a little quick plug for our Saturday morning meeting. We've actually started an 8 a.m. Saturday morning meeting in Apex where we read a whole chapter at a time. I know 8 a.m. is horrible, but I'll tell you what, if I was up when I drank, I would have been drinking at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I can crack a big book open instead of a Budweiser, and, uh, but we actually read the whole chapter at a time like we did where we got sober, and uh, where it's called the One Chapter at a Time group, cleverly named, so uh, if you're ever still up after Friday night, come see us, but uh, anyway, I, uh, you know, I just have a life beyond my wildest dreams here. Those little kids that I, that I didn't even have when I got sober are 27 and 29 now. You know, I'm a grandmother. I'm, I know you're saying to yourself, I'm way too young to be a grandmother, but, uh, you know, uh, the princess will be four in July, and, uh, you know, our daughters, 
She just never, she had such a bright future in AA light out for her when she was little, and she just took that weird turn on us and got normal, and she's still normal. We don't really know what to do with her. We just call and say hi every now and then and <laughs> ask her what we should do next. And <laughs> when she was 14, we told her, you know, there's supposed to be one mature person in the house. Congratulations. We're pretty sure it's you. <laughs> But uh, I want to thank you all. I don't want to hold anybody up from lunch. And uh, if you are new, please. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.